and then you see these spots in the sky. And we see these spots with a confidence level of 99.98%. Now, I've heard various people criticize this model, but they don't seem to talk about that. His theory is my second favorite theory. <laughs> This a theory about the world saying something new and non-testable. Um, it's too easy. You can say everything you want, and then uh, and then I mean the the big book uh, Roger about fancy, fancy fantasy. What it is, it made very clear the fact that yes, there is a part of theoretical physics which have gone a little bit astray. I I, I would say. Okay, um, Roger. In terms of your theory of conformal cyclic uh, cosmology, um, how would that fall along this line of um, uh, predictions of future observations? Um, would uh, is that is your CCC theory subject to the yes. non-science attack? No, no, um, no. But you see, it has two things. I would say, first of all, trying to understand the picture. I mean, the original idea came from trying to appreciate how you could have a Big Bang, which was free of the gravitational degrees of freedom. And the idea it came from a former student of mine, start, started with, that you think of the Big Bang and you've got to see how do you make, make it free of gravitational degrees of freedom. Well, the idea was to stretch it out conformally, so that means you change the scale without changing uh, the <clears throat> I'd have to explain what conformity means you you scale up or scale down so I mean the artist MC Escher was very good at depicting like his circle limits and you can see these angels and devils and the closer they get into the boundary they're more or less the same shape but they're different sizes and that's conformal that's a conformal picture so it's a good conformal picture of what infinity might be like Mm -hmm. The idea here is the Big Bang, as I say, my former student Paul Todd had this suggestion that the way you could make the Big Bang special in this particular way is to say when you stretch it out formally, then it's nice and smooth. And that's almost the big view I have. I, I went a little further and said, not it nice and smooth, just like that, but conformally, it's very like what the remote future should be like. Mm. The, the scale is very different. The remote future is very spread out, very undense, very uh, cold. The Big Bang is very dense, very hot, and c looks like the complete opposite. But from the conformal point of view, they're very, very similar. If you squash down infinity, it gets hotter. Mm -hmm. If you stretch out the Big Bang, it gets colder. And it gets less dense, and the, big, and the remote future becomes more dense. And so it's not so ridiculous to think that from a normal perspective, the Big Bang is very like what we expect in the remote future. You had a wonderful way of describing this when, when we first met. You said something like, uh, um, after aeons of time, the universe forgets its, its own size. And so the universe, and so the universe doesn't know its own size anymore. And it, it assumes it's the beginning of, uh, of a new era. Something like that. But you see, let me attach, attack the second point. You see, you raised about observation. There are observational predictions of CCC, conformal types of cosmology, and these observational predictions are confirmed, remarkably enough. The most remarkable one, I would say, is the one where there's a paper in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, getting on for about five years ago, I'm not sure how long ago it was, written by um, Christoph Meisner, Pavel Nurovsky, Daniel Ann, and my sense, myself. And the, we, we look for effects of, you see, now we're thinking about the remote future of what I call an eon. The eon begins with its black Big Bang, ends with its remote future being all rarefied. And then that joins on to the next eon because it becomes conformal, so you can't tell big from small, and then that becomes the Big Bang of the next eon. Now, one of the big observational tests of this, what happens to the black holes? Now, the black holes, they sit there. I'm talking about supermassive black holes, galactic clusters. The galaxy, Each galaxy pretty well has a black hole in it. 
and then they collide and the holes get bigger and bigger and then you start swallowing the stars. I should think a good proportion, probably the majority of the stars, eventually get swallowed by this black hole. So it's huge. That black hole sits around, sits around, sits around until the universe's ambient temperature gets smaller than the Hawking temperature of that black hole, which, as I said before, is something like 10 to 100 years. And then it starts to evaporate away. What happens to all the energy in that black hole? Well, that galactic cluster, that galactic cluster gets converted into, into radiation of one form or another. Now, that radiation, since it happens so low, so, sorry, since it happens so late, when you join it onto the next eon, it's more or less a point. Because the you look at mm. the Escher pictures, that's another example again, you think of very, very close to the edge of the Escher pictures, the angels and devils are getting so small that whatever happens there is more or less a point. So that all this radiation coming out of that black hole will be focused into one little point. As it comes through on the other side, there will be a burst of energy. Now that burst of energy eventually just heats up the material around it, and it gets to a certain size, which is about as big as it can get um, from the history of the, um, well, when it, when it gets seeable, that is uh, when it starts uh, entering the uh, material of the universe, the universe cools down until radiation can get out, and then you see these spots in the sky. And we see these spots with a confidence level of 99.98%. Now, I've heard various people criticize this model, but they don't seem to talk about that. They have ways of seeing less. <laughs> I find it rather ironic in a way. They say, when you do the analysis my way, you don't see quite such a strong signal. Well, so what? I Laura, how does Rogers' conformal cyclical cosmology um, inter interact or uh, associate with your theory of how universes form uh, from a, a quantum multiverse? Again, uh, it's very different theories because uh, Rogers' theory relies on uh, conformal symmetries and conformal transformations. Having said that, his theory is my second favorite theory after mine being <laughs> the first. <laughs> because um, he, he does not uh, break the second law of thermodynamics. There is such a natural um, beauty about the, the whole idea that uh, the, the universe keeps expanding forever in uh, this desider state. Uh, you lose the clocks, time stops because you are not allowed to change the entropy. So you can rescale that whole gigantic nothingness into something small and start all over again. And as the Roger explained, then you need a little ripple there so you can change the entropy. You you move away from the state of uh, constant the sitter entropy. So I I, uh, I I like this idea very much. It, it has no connection to mine. Mine is you start with the wave function of the universe into a phase space. You have a pool of possible energies that. Uh, uh, the the universe can can choose from to to start uh, its own big bang. Then I use a, a canonical quantum gravity uh, Wheeler De Witt type of equation, where um, which tells you it derives the answer. It says if you allow your wave function to go through this potential energy with many values, then this is what you get as a solution. Quantum entanglement is a huge problem, and in fact, I was going to ask um, Carlo about uh, this problem of entanglement in uh, white hole, black hole scenarios. But in, in my case, you have all the branches of the wave function being quantum entangled uh, with one another. So as each branch will sit in its own vacuum, borrow the energy of that vacuum in order to go through that uh, initial phase of uh, inflationary expansion, you have many such branches doing similar things at different energies. You have to, to find a way of separating, of decoupling these branches from each other, because that is what um, triggers the quantum to classical transition. As, the, as that branch grows big and becomes your own universe, it will become a classical universe, although it started from a uh, quantum origin. So in the process of wiping out entanglement, you, you involve something called uh, decoherence, 
uh, where you have an interaction of the uh, wave function of the universe with an environment. Now, there are conditions. That, that's the problem of the observer in uh, cosmology. There are conditions on, on the environment that is watching your system, your, your wave function of the universe. It has to interact very weakly with the system so that in the process of watching it, it does not interfere with the outcome of that measurement. So very long wavelength fluctuations is, is the path of fluctuations we took for, uh, for calculating the coherence. But that very early on quantum entanglement that is being gradually wiped out leaves a dent in our CMP sky because although the CMB is uh, observed much later, the primordial fluctuations that will give rise later to CMB and large scale structure are produced during the foldings of inflation, during the first uh, fraction of a second of, of the inflationary expansion. Okay, um, Roger, I think that's the highest compliment that a cosmologist can get when another cosmologist says your theory is her second favorite. Okay. So that's that's yeah, <laughs> that's quite 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 a color. Carla, I, I get, give some summary to this section by saying uh, what's the right kind of balance between certainly being cautious about speculative ideas and forcing it to have a very high uh, a standard of, of rigor uh, while remaining uh, ambitious and creative and in in, uh, in the desire to to find new truths and and to ultimately learn as much as we can. I'm not very worried. I mean, time will say. Time will will just uh, do the filtrage. Um, some some ideas will get lost. Some will survive, and uh, some will surprisingly find some uh, some some uh, some consensual observations. Roger, uh, observations come out uh, more and more clear, and more and more people get convinced that these are. Uh, 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 patterns in the CMB, uh, then the, the the interest will will keep growing. Um, so I, the, there are many open problems. I I am not I'm not a cosmologist. Uh, I work on much smaller scale. I'm a chemist with respect to what Laura and, and Roger. Uh, I, I've been working on on a specific theory of quantum gravity, which is a a theory of quantum gravity phenomena is not about the universe. It's not about the 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 the, 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 the long future. What's going to happen in the long future? Is is it? It's about here and now and the possible quantum gravitational phenomena happening here and now. And uh, uh, it's much lower scale uh, enterprise. I mean, we 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 do have a theory of quantum gravity. We compute things. We were trying to see where we can compute things. Uh, which can be can be observables and the the quantization of the area, which is the specific uh, prediction of quantum gravity, uh, for long seemed to us uh, not connected to observation. How can you measure an area um, of a Planck scale? It's extremely small. But the Planck scale area for a surface of a black hole or a white hole, it's a Planck mass, and a Planck mass is uh, a microgram. is uh, is the weight of my hair. So it's neither very small nor very large. It's something we can access. So here is a specific prediction. And I think it's true for all these ideas. Uh, if, if they can give specific prediction and the moment in which something is consensus about the observation, a lot of things would be forgotten and some will remain, as always in science, since ever. Yeah, the the argument though is that uh, in today's world there's a there's a great unity between dealing with quantum gravity on the micro scale and what happens in the universe, whether it's black holes, a big bang, or or beyond. That you really need to solve both of those problems in parallel. They can't be teased apart. Uh, they should be maybe studied apart, but ultimately they have to work together. No, I don't think we're at the end of the science. I mean, we don't think we have to look at ultimately solution of everything. We are very far from an ultimate solution of everything. We are in the dark. We are completely in the dark. We shouldn't look at the final theory of the universe, the final explanation of everything. We should understand one thing at a time. No, yeah, no, no, certainly agree with that. But that ultimately you have to unify the two to be able to understand either completely as, as a goal. Ultimately, I don't know. I mean, ultimately, we should live in peace and not make war. That's more. Fun. I mean, <laughs> ultimately, it's a let's. Uh, I I see specific questions, specific problems that science can address, 
And I think science works better in this way rather than think what is the ultimate thing we want to look at, we want to get at. Okay. Um, let's go on to theme three, and I want to get back to Whitehall's, the theme of our debate, um, and ask some big questions about what the theory of Whitehall's uh, would imply, uh, irrespective of whether they really exist, because it, it is a theoretical test bed, uh, a stress test, if you, if you will, uh, for the theories of physics. To continue watching this video, Click the link in the top left or in the description below. With a free trial, you can enjoy the full talk and thousands more. Thank you for being part of the conversation.